Uh, th thank you, Andre. Thank you, organizers, for the invitation. It's uh, actually my second time at uh, Yandex, uh, courtesy of uh, Andre and his group. And uh, I have, like the first time, I've enjoyed visiting very much. I think you have a fantastic building here. It's really nice and cool. Uh, very clever names for the rooms. Uh, I don't know if you've visit, had a chance to visit, but they have a very clever ways to uh, uh, give names to the rooms, uh, but you have to speak Russian for that, so maybe. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a nice building. I've been to Google, but I think uh, your building is even nicer, and I won't say anything about Microsoft because people are sitting here, so <laughs> I don't want to offend anybody. Uh, I've changed uh, my title uh, a little bit and extended the scope, so rather than, uh, as announced in the uh, ab abstract and the program, talking just about limits of local algorithms, I want to also say something about power. It makes sense to first start with the power of local algorithms and then switch to um, uh, limit. And uh, I did it because I didn't realize the talk is actually one hour and a half, so I could cover more ground. And therefore, I will do that. Um, this is a joint work uh, with uh, uh, David Goldberg, my former student who is now in Georgia Tech. Uh, Theo van Weber, also my former student, who is uh, in industry now working for analog devices, and uh, Madhu Sudan, uh, uh, who is in my Microsoft research. So again, big Microsoft presence <laughs> in this, and I'm just a few steps from Microsoft myself, so consider myself also a part of Microsoft for practical purposes. Uh, let me begin with some high-level thoughts. So if you s look at this... Uh, uh, high-level remarks, you might think that I just stole them from Jennifer's talk yesterday, but I did not. I, I actually, this is completely independent. Uh, <laughs> I promise you that. So, um, well, the, uh, the, the talk is about uh, uh, algorithms for large-scale networks, and uh, networks that we're really interested in are indeed very, very large. And uh, like a World Wide Web is... Uh, close to a billion now uh, websites. Uh, if you look at this, uh, some networks are even larger than that. They are, if you look at the human brain, it's uh, about 10 to the 11. Uh, so it's a 100 billion uh, size uh, network. And when you deal with networks of that uh, scale, if you want to perform some computation there, then perhaps the models that we traditionally deem scalable, something like polynomial time algorithm, that's a, that's a canonical <laughs> framework for some, something which is, you know, fast algorithm, and this talk will be, is about algorithms on networks, perhaps this is not a very good model for that large-scale network because even linear time algorithm might not be good enough because uh, you might not even be able to load your model to your system, let alone perform some kind of a polynomial time computation. And in this case, perhaps local algorithms, sublinear algorithms, but uh, I will focus here primarily on local algorithms, is a promising framework. And, um, and that's very much consistent with, with, with uh, what uh, Jennifer, uh, uh, Jennifer's comments yesterday. But I want to also uh, link it with the interesting and fascinating property of correlation decay, uh, which provides uh, mathematical validation for, the, uh, for uh, justifying the usage of local algorithms. When, when can we say the al local algorithms, and I haven't defined what do those are, of course, and I will, I will at some point, but uh, when, when is it the case that local algorithms uh, give you a right answer, whatever the word right means, uh, and it turns out to be co connected with this fascinating property of correlation decay, which comes from physics. And, uh, but, it will, but I'll try to convince you that, in fact, it goes above and beyond f traditional physics models such as Gibbs measures. That's the context that you perhaps have seen it uh, mostly. So... Um, so first, uh, uh, b before even uh, talking about uh, correlation decay property, what are the local algorithms? At this stage, let's, let's, uh, let me introduce a very loose uh, definition. Uh, imagine that you have a, a large network, and you need to solve some problem on that. That uh, in, my, uh, in my world, I'm interested in solving some combinatorial optimization problem. On this, uh, on this graph. But it could be some inference problem. Perhaps you have some Gibbs measure on this graph and you want to compute the m uh, marginal probabilities associated with nodes. Perhaps you're having some graphical game 
on this network and you want to compute uh, a, a, you know, a Nash equilibrium uh, decision. It could be, it could be br uh, broad. Um, so we'll say the algorithm is local if it makes, makes decisions based on the, based on the uh, local information. So it just studies its own neighborhood, maybe neighbors, neighbors of the neighbors, or neighbors of the neighbors of the neighbors, uh, and based on that information, makes a decision. And the decision, again, if it's optimization, it declares what needs to be the uh, optimal value associated with this particular node. If it is uh, inference, it declares the marginal probability associated with this node. And having such, uh, so when, when would something like this be, the, when would something like this be justified? Uh, well, uh, in case you have a correlation decay property, that could be justified. So what is roughly speaking correlation decay property? Imagine that you have these nodes of your graphs are, of your graph is, are, are associated with some random variables. Some random variables. So each of this, uh, uh, on top of each of this node, you have some random variable sitting and they are correlated, random variables, otherwise it's not interesting, and the correlation structure is provided by this graph. So for example, uh, what it means is that if I fix a particular node here, and I give you the realization of random variables in the neighborhoods, like these three neighbors of this particular node, then this becomes, uh, then the random variable associated with this node becomes as independent from the rest uh, uh, of it. So that means, it's a graphical model, that's a canonical model, called graphical model, or also called Markov random field model. Uh, and that means that you have a bunch of random variables sitting on the graph. Uh, I will actually, how about, I'll try to repeat the question, so if you, if you don't want to use a, um, a, a microphone. So the question is, does it mean that I assume short range or long range correlations? No. Uh, all I'm assuming, as far as the model is concerned, and I'm actually not even precise here, but all I'm assuming is that uh, th this is there, is there is a sort of pairwise graphical model. But in, in but uh, so it, I'm just assuming conditional independence of the nodes, conditional on the variables. But when you look at the correlations between the nodes at a far distance, they still could be long range dependent at the long distances. So that's not ruled out, right? So that's, did I understand the question correctly? Yeah, because Gibbs measure is very special in that sense. Uh, Gibbs measure is, uh, is a special in this case, uh, uh, correct. But I will actually primarily discuss models which are not Gibbs, even Gibbs measure. Thank you. Uh, but, uh, but suppose it is the case that uh, when you have a model defined on this, uh, this graphical model, suppose it is the case that when you look at the uh, variables associated with nodes at a high distance, uh, then there are asymptotically independent. So as the comment was made, uh, suppose it was the long range independent model, uh, or al alternatively, suppose the, we, we do have a correlation decay property, uh, that would be very nice in this case, because that means that in order to uh, make an inference about, about a particular node, I don't have to look at the entire complicated model, I can just restrict my uh, uh, inference problem just on a short, uh, small neighborhood around my node, and that will be approximately correct. Approximately to the extent how fast correlations die out at the distances. So, and that's a canonical uh, uh, object in statistical physics uh, in, in, and related to the uniqueness of Gibbs measures and so on. If you know what it is, that's fine, but if you don't, that's that's, again, not terribly important for me because I will go outside of the, uh, I'll go outside of the uh, uh, Gibbs uh, framework. Okay, so that would be uh, nice and uh, because, as, as I said, in this case, uh, doing inference uh, for a particular node based on the entire graph is the same thing as just restricting yourself to a short, uh, small neighborhood around the node, and that means that the local algorithm computations based on local information could be validated. So if having something like this it, it is good. So two things I want to uh, link there for, the local algorithms and presence or absence of long range uh, independence. Okay, so perhaps there are no, no questions as of now because I haven't defined anything rigorously, right? So I'll, 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 I'll do that uh, 
soon. Now, uh, who is interested in local algorithms? And uh, there is a whole bunch of communities. I didn't even list here all the communities interested in uh, local algorithms. Uh, perhaps I should start from theoretical computer science because that's the community which uh, introduces the notion of algorithms rigorously. And they're interested in local algorithms, and, but often they call them decentralized algorithms and for their own reasons. For example, studying the parallel algorithms and the networks in this case is the network of uh, processors interconnected to each other. But that's not exactly the framework I'm interested in because in my uh, in, for, my, for my interest, the networks are, is naturally given uh, to me by the problem. The network could be World Wide Web or the brain or something like that. So it's not the network that I designed by connecting processes to each other. However, in the local algorithms is an is a, uh, old field in theoretical computer science. Recently, there is some resurgence of interest due to this uh, sequence uh, series of papers. And very nice survey by uh, Suomela in 2011 gives a very good uh, state-of-the-art uh, 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 no knowledge for the local uh, algorithms. But uh, not just the radical computer science, electrical engineers are interested in that in signal processing and in specifically in the context of so-called the belief propagation algorithm, which is, and I won't define it what it is, but it's, it is essentially a local algorithm for inference in uh, models such as Markov random field and this, the model uh, is of obvious interest in, in, in uh, uh, machine learning and statistics. Uh, so that's the, that's the interest of electrical engineers in signal processing, uh, machine learning, and statisticians in, in the local algorithms. And perhaps surprisingly, uh, recently, the, uh, an interest in local algorithms emerged uh, in the field of mathematics, but not so much in the algorithmic mathematics. That wouldn't be surprising at all. But mathematicians who are interested in, uh, in, uh, in, in uh, questions related to the graph, so-called graph limits. That's uh, related to Christian's talk uh, yesterday. But it, uh, it turns out the, notions of, uh, the notion of local algorithm is related, to, uh, 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 is related in some uh, interesting and but somewhat complicated way to the... Uh, to the um, uh, question of convergence of uh, sparse, uh, sparse graphs. So it, 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 if you have a, uh, the local algorithms provide you to some way to formalizing limits, uh, li limiting objects of uh, limit, uh, sequences of sparse graphs. But the connection is a little bit too complicated uh, uh, to state. The only reason, uh, and explain, the only reason I mentioned that is that this group of people, uh, in particular in the, the first three, have introduced a, a, a particular framework of local algorithms. And that's the framework I will use when I discuss limits of local algorithms. So if we want to establish some negative results, saying something that something is not possible by using local algorithms, I have to have something well-defined. Uh, right, and that's the framework I will use, and comes uh, from this uh, uh, paper, to be introduced rigorously and uh, formally later on. So I have tested your patience uh, already quite uh, a, a bit uh, now. So it's perhaps it's about time to introduce something more concrete and uh, and rigorous uh, in mathematical sense. Um, throughout this talk, I will. For the sake of simplicity, but also because that's where the most of the results are, I will focus on a one particular combinatorial optimization problem, which is a well-known problem uh, of mark finding a maximum independent set in a graph. So the problem is that, and I, probably most of you are familiar with that, but to remind you, uh, we have an undirected graph. So V is a set of nodes, and E is a set of edges, and that could be your, uh, your graph. Uh, an independent set is the collection of, of nodes such that no two nodes in the set are connected by an edge. So if I didn't make uh, an uh, obvious error here, this uh, collection of dark nodes is an independent set. Uh, I'm not saying that this is the largest independent set. I didn't attempt to find such a uh, thing. Uh, but it is an independent set because no two dark nodes are connected by an edge. Um, and the question, which is the canonical question in the, uh, in the algorithmic theory, is given such a graph, find a largest independent set. 
in the independent set with largest cardinality. Um, you could have several. It's easy to construct examples where you have several independent sets of the largest cardinality. That's why I'm saying a largest independent set, not the, the largest independent set. That's an NP-hard problem, uh, which means that it's unlikely that you're going to have ever an algorithm to find it, uh, the largest. But not, not just that. It is actually a very uh, nasty problem, uh, even in a class of NP-hard problems. Some problems which are NP-hard are not that NP-hard, <laughs> in the sense that you can, yeah, you can sort of twist, you can, you can perturb the uh, problem a bit and find something, maybe pseudo-polynomial time algorithm, maybe approximate algorithm, but this one is really bad. And to tell you how bad it is, um, uh, let me uh, now, for uh, at least for this part of the talks, uh, turn to the uh, concept of so-called approximation factor um, uh, uh, algorithms. So, okay, so it is unlikely that you will ever be able to find largest independent set in the graph in using polynomial time algorithm. Uh, but let's say, suppose you want to find an L, uh, independent set such that uh, the ratio of the optimal to your independent set, so I star is the largest independent set, cardinality, and I hat is whatever you find by your polynomial time algorithm. Uh, suppose, you, suppose you want to just guarantee that this ratio is at most uh, some number rho. In, in case you do that, you say that I have a row factor approximation algorithm for solving largest independent set problem, and it's a big, big field in, in, in a computer science, in theoretical computer science, uh, to, find, uh, 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 to find approximation guarantees for a variety of problems, including largest independent set problem. Okay, so the question is, okay, if rho is equal to one, uh, then, then it means you, you want to find the largest independent set, that's NP-hard, but so you have to make rho larger. And the question is, how large can you, can you actually, uh, well, how close to unity can you actually guarantee uh, to have an algorithm? And there are some positive results, but let me actually tell you the negative results. And the negative results tell you that, in fact, even if you deal with a very sparse graph, graphs would, would say with the largest degree at most three, largest degree at most three, even then you have to, you, you cannot find an asymptotically optimal independent set in the sense that if rho is uh, 1.0072, which is an artifact of the proof, but whatever, if rho is that number, uh, you cannot uh, find independent set with that ratio guarantee unless p is equal to np, right? And, uh, so that's the, and, and degree three is the, is the sparsest you can meaningfully assume because if the degree is at most two, then, then it's a bunch of, your graph is a bunch of cycles and paths, and then it's trivial to find a, a largest independent set. So three is the first interesting case. And even in the first interesting case, when degree is at most three, even then you cannot find a largest independent set with some approximation guarantee. And then there is a similar result when degree is four, then the number is slightly larger, and degree five is the number is even slightly larger. These numbers are not probably tied, but this is just an artifact of the, of, of the proof, and it was done by uh, Berman and Karpinski, uh, and, uh, and it's a part of the big, again, big uh, agenda in approximation algorithms to find approximation guarantees. All right, I started with local algorithms and correlation decay property, and all of a sudden I'm talking about approximation algorithms for combinatorial optimization problem. Now let me connect the two things. Um, let me, instead of trying to nail down these constants and so on, let me change the problem. And uh, the way I'm going to change the problem is that I will consider, I will do something which a priori should make it even harder. Um, suppose I ma make the problem stochastic. I will populate the nodes of my graph with random weights. Um, so now, in, and instead of trying to find a largest in cardinality independent set problem, I want to find largest weighted independent set. So a, an independent set such that the total weight associated with nodes of this independent set is as large as possible. If anything, that should be even harder than the original problem, making problem going from a deterministic problems to stochastic optimization usually makes things more complicated. But it turns out, surprisingly, 
that at least for certain classes of distribution, and specifically for the exponential distribution, independent, so I have to assume something. Uh, I cannot, for example, assume that the weights are correlated because if all of the weights are identical, then I'm back to the cardinality problem, so I have to do something here. And uh, so if the weights are independent and exponentially distributed, then surprisingly, uh, the problem can be solved with the arbitrary level of, uh, of guarantee, uh, not only using polynomial time algorithm, but actually using local algorithm. And I'll try to convince you of that uh, uh, soon, but let's, let me just make uh, sure that uh, everybody understands what, uh, what the result, what the claim is. So any, any questions about that? Now that I got a little bit technical here, is any, any questions about what, what, what we're saying here? No. Okay, uh, now I might sort of uh, hypothetically ask some questions. Okay, exponential distribution, and that works only in degree three. What about larger degree? Uh, you can still do larger degrees, but you have to make distributions somewhat different if you, assume, uh, if you assume that the distributions are mixtures of exponentials and the mixture, the weights of the mixtures have to be designed in an appropriate way, then you can still uh, do that and show that even then uh, uh, the uh, problem admits uh, asymptotically uh, optimal solution, which is in sh sharp contrast with the previous, uh, in the cardinality setting, uh, where such guarantee is impossible unless p is equal to uh, np. Okay, and, and the proof technique is, is based on the local algorithm, which for the purposes of this problem, I call the cavity, uh, we call the cavity expansion. And the reason this whole thing works is because introducing random weights in this problem does uh, introduce the correlation decay property in some appropriate uh, sense. And that's what I want to uh, discuss for the next uh, uh, few uh, uh, minutes. So that I know the time, when, when do I end the, the, the 1.30 as, as stated, or, or we, did we start a little, yeah? Yes, yes, 1.30. Yeah, okay, so hopefully I won't uh, need more, uh, more time. So um, what, is the, what is the algorithm? I, I had a couple of pictures that I wanted to show you, but unfortunately I didn't, uh, I didn't load the latest version, so that, that's the, del the reason for the delay, and my apologies for that. So no pictures, just, just, just mathematics. Um, so what is the uh, algorithm? Uh, if you are familiar with belief propagation algorithm, then you can think of it as a, as a natural way to extend the belief propagation algorithm in some way. But that's in case you know what it is. But, but otherwise, it's a completely self-contained uh, dis uh, discussion. So, um, okay, our goal is to find a largest uh, independent set uh, largest weighted independent set of a graph. Uh, and suppose I fix a particular node V0, uh, and uh, now let's reason as follows. Uh, well, one largest independent set, it comes either in one of the two forms. Either it contains uh, this node V0, or it does not contain this node V0, okay? So, uh, and let's expand this a little bit further. In the case, start with this case. Suppose it was the case that uh, V0, and then you have to take the maximum of two. So let this denote the largest independent set of the graph, which excludes V0. And let this denote the largest independent set of the graph, which is forced to take V0. Both are suboptimal, but one of the two will give you the largest. Right? By, by trivial, uh, by, uh, just an obvious, um, uh, obvious statement here. Now start with this, uh, this, this, with this object. If V0 does not belong to the largest independent set, well, that means what, I really, what I'm really considering, I'm considering a reduced graph where this node is deleted and the edges is deleted, and I'm simply looking at the largest independent set in the subgraph. That's, that's all there is uh, to it. Now, in case um, my largest independent set is uh, forced to take uh, this node V0, well, because it's an independent set, I have to exclude nodes which are neighbors. On the positive side, uh, I, I include the weight of the V0 does contribute to the, uh, to the solution, right? So let's uh, then uh, write it like this. The largest independent set is the maximum of two objects. 
largest independent set in the graph where V0 is excluded, as I said before, or W0, the weight of this node, plus the largest independent set, but in a graph where not only we exclude this node, but all the neighbors as well. And I did count the weight of this in node into the, my potential optimal solution. Right? So it's one of the two things, uh, and one of these two will give me the largest. Now, the, the name of the algorithm says cavity, and cavity is the trick that physicists have invented to uh, deal with these kind of problems in somewhat different setting, mostly on random graphs, but, it, but the, idea is, uh, by the idea is similar. The idea is that rather than looking at the largest independent set object itself, look at the relative uh, value of the optimization problem when you include versus include a particular node. And that's what they call the cavity. You introduce like a cavity, a hole in your problem, and you're saying, okay, now that I've included it or excluded it, how does the objective value changes? How does the optimal solution changes? Okay, so in, in, in my context, what it means is that, okay, it, it means something very straightforward. Let me, let me subtract that object from the both parts of this identity. So look at the W star minus this object, and then the identity is rewritten like this. It's the difference of the optimal value versus optimal value with V0 in excluded is equal to the maximum, well, zero, because you have uh, two identical terms here, this is one subtracted from another, and W0 minus, and I just rewrote it uh, like this. It was uh, this minus this, so I just put it in parentheses, so it's W0 minus this. Might look, might look redundant, but there is a reason to do that. So now, uh, let me introduce the uh, object, which is a cavity object, and this object is precisely the difference of uh, objective uh, values, optimal, so, uh, optimal values. And uh, so, uh, this, the cavity value for the graph G at node V0 is the difference of optimal solution versus optimal solution with node V0 excluded. Right? So that's by, that's by definition. And what I have done now, I've managed to express the cavity at the node V0 in terms of this object. Well, let's see what this is. W0 remains the same. Uh, what this difference is, if you think about it, is the difference uh, of the optimal values when just node V0 is excluded versus V0, V1, V2, and V3 are uh, excluded. An alternative way to say that is you take a graph G minus V0, so you graph excluding this node and the remaining part, and you're saying what's the cavity, what's the relative distance when relative difference of objective uh, values when I also exclude nodes V1, V2, and V3. Okay, I don't know if you followed uh, from here to here, but let me assure you that that's a re relatively straightforward uh, observation. Uh, 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 but uh, the fallout of that is that, well, I made some progress in the sense that I managed to express the cavity associated with node with the cavity associated with the set of nodes. And just to remind you what this object is, it's the difference of, uh, in the graph G minus V0, we look at the largest independent set versus largest independent set where these three nodes are excluded. Okay, so that's, unfortunately, that's, not, not good enough for me because I've expressed the cavity of a node in terms of the cavity uh, of, of a set. And I want to make it apples to apples. I want to express the cavity of a node in terms of cavity of other nodes in the modified graph so that I have to sort of uh, uh, stay within the domain of, cav uh, of cavities associated with nodes. But this can be done for the, by the following observation. And it's this, uh, uh, motivated by a similar trick that draw weights used uh, in the analysis of, uh, of, uh, of Gibbs distribution. But this is how it works in our case. All right, so pictorially, we need to look at the difference of independent set with just this node excluded versus all four nodes excluded. Write this difference in terms of as a, as a, uh, as a telescoping sum of differences of intermediate terms. So rather than excluding all three nodes simultaneously, first ex exclude the left node, 
and look at this difference, then put it back and look at the, uh, at the difference when you exclude the left and the middle node, but then then put back this term, and then look at the difference when you exclude left and middle here versus left and middle and the right node. All right? Now, what is the reason to do that? The reason is that now each of these looks, each of these is the cavity associated with one node only, one node only, but in modified graph. So for example, if you look at this difference, this is the difference of largest independent set with, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in this graph, containing these two nodes and everything else remaining in the, in, in the graph, versus the same graph, but now also excluding this node as well. OK, so not, I don't know if this was uh, clear, clear or not, but the idea is that you can actually write cavity uh, associated with node in terms of, and this, because, and this cancel out because it's a telescoping sequ sequence, cavity associated with the set as a sum of the cavities associated with nodes in appropriately modified graph. And, when you, and then you put things together, and basically the fallout of this is that the cavity associated with the original uh, node is expressed as some operator of the, uh, of the form max uh, of zero, weight of this node minus these three different cavities. Well, the reason to do that, the reason to do that is that this operator, which maps now, let's forget about the fact that we're dealing with optimization problem, and uh, trying to find a largest independent set and everything, just look at its, this object abstractly. You have a three to one function, which maps th vector of three values into one quantity. And uh, one randomness involving, involved in this quantity is just the random weight of the node, which is exponentially distributed. Because I assume that the weights are exponentially distributed. Okay? Well, it turns out that this operator in some appropriate sense, is a contraction. Contraction, in, in a roughly speaking, in the sense that if I perturb the values here, if I switch from x1, x2, x3, to y1, y2, and y3, and you look at the implied, different implied value here, the values of the output will be closer to each other than the values of the input. I'm sorry? With respect to which norm? Uh, it is, uh, because it's a stochastic uh, uh, model, what happens, okay, so let, let me elaborate uh, on that. It turns out that because this is exponentially distributed, the random variables involved are exponential random variables with a point mass at zero, with a point mass at zero. So what happens when you do that, the point masses associated with the output is closer than the point masses associated with the input. So if they, these point masses, let's say, were 0.3 and 0.4 and for x1, and this were like, again, difference on 0.1 on all of them, this would be something like 0.5. So in that sense, it's, it's contracting. Uh, is that? Yeah. So it's a stochastic, some, uh, some stochastic contraction uh, uh, it, it takes place. But what does it mean? Well, and how are we going to take advantage of that? Well, and what's, the, and what's the algorithm? So what? It's a contraction. The idea is that to keep doing that for these nodes as well and expand them in terms of their own cavities and the, the, the neighbors, uh, of the neighbors and so on. Keep, keep, uh, keep doing that. Keep doing that. And then you have some, some kind of a recursive tree construction here where the original cavity associated with the original node is in, in, expressed in terms of, well, I have four here, but it's really three uh, cavities associated with three neighbors, and then you do it for them, and uh, keep doing, and keep doing, and so on. All right. So in principle, if I did it all the way to to the to the to the end, I could just compute the cavities exactly, but the computation time grows, as you can imagine, exponentially in depth. However, because of the correlation decay property, it means that perhaps I don't need to go to the full depth and just stop at some depth. M and start, start the computation at some arbitrarily chosen values. And then when I compu compute it back, because the errors are collapsing at the uh, geometric rate, then 
even though I've started with completely different, completely random uh, guess, my uh, estimation at the root will be geometrically accurate, geometrically in the depth of uh, that tree, in the depth of that tree. But what it implies also, what it implies is that this model does exhibit uh, decay of correlation property, which means that I have to go to one of my, which means that the probability that this node is part of the largest independent set is asymptotically decorrelated the probability of, for other nodes when the distances are far away from each other. Uh, and that happens, takes place because I have uh, random weights, because I have exponential weights. Somehow these exponential weights break the long range, the rigidity of the cardinality problem. They bring the long range dependence that you do have in the cardinality problem and make it long range in independent. Yes. 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 It's yeah. I, I I have to change the problem because if I was making a claim that I have a polynomial time algorithm which get, get with arbitrary guarantee, I would be checking. I have to check my mind, right? So because it's uh, it's NP hard to approximate. So I did change the uh, the problem, but uh, I I did change the problem. So it's a maximum weight independent set with exponentially distributed uh, weights. Uh, and independent weights. Yeah. Are the, yes? Uh, so the question is, is it significant that I use exponential distribution? Uh, the answer is uh, uh, no. It also works for mix certain mixtures of exponentials, and in fact, even for higher degrees. This method actually prov probably fails when the degree is larger than 3 but distribution is still exponential. In that case, even on tree, you can show that there is a long range dependence and therefore that method breaks down. But if the degree is larger, three or larger, then I can take a mixture of exponential and still exhibit long range independence and the algorithm would work. Um, but uh, even, uh, so I think uh, that's all I wanted to say about uh, uh, right, so this is just to wrap, uh, wrap up. We have the correlation decay property. It means, that, it means that the estimation is close to the truth and the, the, the estimation decays at the geometric rate with respect to the depth uh, of the tree and therefore you can design uh, a polynomial time algorithm, in fact, a local algorithm because this computation is done locally. You look at the node, you're looking at neighbors, neighbors of the neighbors, you do it at certain constant depth uh, m, which is a function of epsilon, and you never need to look outside of a small constant size na neighborhood of a particular node to figure out whether this node belongs to the largest independent set or not. So it is a local time algorithm. To, to do that for the entire uh, graph, you have to multiply by n, which is just the number of nodes to make a decision for every node. Um, now, there is a there is a variant of that. So the, this generalizes not only by changing the distribution of weights, but also if you, uh, if you, even if you change the problem a little bit. So rather than talking about largest independent set problem, uh, now let me consider a generic stochastic optimization problem on graphs. So uh, what's the setup? Suppose I have again an, a graph, an undirected graph, for simplicity, let's assume that the decisions, uh, so you have to make decision for every node of this graph and the decisions are binary. It's either zero or one. You have to decide, do you do one or the other? You go to the restaurant or you don't go to the restaurant. You vote Republican, you vote Democrat, things like that, right? And suppose the model, model is stochastic in the following sense. Uh, for every decision, uh, of an, uh, for every decision uh, of, for every, and for every node, you have a random variable associated with this node and decision pair. And that's given by this uh, random function phi. So phi has two, com uh, two random uh, variables associated with node zero and node one. But to make the model interesting, to make it uh, uh, a model defined on the graph, suppose also you have uh, 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 values, random quantities associated with edges. So if you have an edge connecting two nodes, then depending on the pairs of decisions 
on the, on the edge, so now you have four possible decisions, there is a cost associated with that. And your goal is to, uh, oh, I didn't uh, say what's the goal. The, the, the goal is to come up with a, a set of decisions which maximize the reward, the total reward. So for every node, you have to make a decision zero or one, and you want to maximize these quantities plus these quantities. Okay. And the independent set problem is a special case of that. Special case in the sense that you just, when you have one and one on the edge, you put this reward equal to minus infinity because you're not allowing independent set. So it's really allowing in, in infinity as values that basically uh, this framework includes uh, independent set problem. And it turns out that, well, now you can say something even if you don't have exponential or hyper exponential mixture of exponential distributions. And there is a general characterization of, of when, uh, when uh, this cavity approach works, but to give you a concrete example, suppose you have, for example, uniform distribution uh, for, the, uh, for the decisions associated with nodes, and also uniform distribution for the decisions associated with pairs of nodes. So for example, if you have a zero, zero decision, then the reward is uniformly distributed between minus I2 and I2. So some uniform distribution in some, uh, in some interval. And I mean, the, the details of the distributions are not terribly important here. What's important is that there is a, you can go outside of exponential distribution. There is no, there is no miracle of exponential distribution that, that is necessary here, that you can, this uh, approach work, works for other distributions as well, and other appropriate conditions on the largest degree of the, uh, of the graph and some relationship between the uh, uh, support of the distribution uh, and, the exp and the conditions are expressed in this form, then again, the cavity algorithm uh, works. You can write cavity in terms of cavities and prove that there you have some kind of a stochastic contraction and therefore a fast local algorithm to compute a pr uh, optimal reward. And that's the, that's the only uh, extension, departure from the independent set model that I wanted to discuss, and so now I'm going to go back to independent set problem, but let me pause here again and ask if you have any questions. Uh, yes, no, nothing, nothing special. Yeah, uh, uh, much harder than what? So if you're saying that stay within the independent set framework or not, I, I, I'm... Well, the cavity expansion algorithm uh, seems to work here rather generally. And you could interpret that by saying that it's because of the excess. Well, it works generally, but still under some condition. So you, you can think of this condition as analog of uniqueness, Gibbs uniqueness condition. You st I still need to... To give you an interpretation of this is that the interpretation of this condition is that when the degree is large, I, the ratio of I2 and I1 has to be very, very small, well, like one of a delta squared, and what's I2 and what's I1? Uh, the ratio of I2 to I1 being very small means that the contribution for the node weights is far more significant than the contribution of the edge weights. And that's sort of, con con it's sort of intuitive that in that case you should have a uniqueness-like behavior, even though we're not talking about Gibbs distribution. But that's, that's, the, that's the intuition. So this is general, but not too general, and because for fundamental reasons, once you have a long-range, you do have long-range independence for good class of models, and in that case, cavity algorithm would not work. So in particular for the independent set, it would be like taking I2 to be infinity. And there your result would fail. Uh, of course, it's not quite the same. It's not quite the same because of the asymmetry uh, of the independent. But right. I think if you have independent set, even with uniform distribution, it would still work, but the proof becomes, proof becomes more involved. Uh, for the independent set, it's convenient to assume exponential distribution because then you have this uh, bonuses have a exponential distribution with point masses at zero. Mm -hmm. Now, how to argue on this? Well, perhaps we, we could actually 
we, we, we didn't think about this framework, this distribution for the independent set problem. To be honest, we just didn't, we didn't look at it. But okay, that, that's you. a natural, natural uh, question. Any other questions uh, before? I, I'm go going to switch gears now completely. And uh, so hopefully I convince you to, for what it's worth, I convince you that, uh, that local algorithms are interesting. They do buy you, uh, they uh, do buy you something. They can solve interesting combinatorial optimization problem. Now I want to switch gears and talk about limits of local algorithms, something that cannot be done. Now, let's pretend for a moment, and I'm about to introduce a, a particular definition of local algorithms shortly, but pretend for now that we know what it is. Decisions based on local information, neighborhood, right? It is not too surprising that you cannot use local algorithms to solve any global problem, right? For example, uh, if you want to find the largest independent set problem in arbitrary graph, if the graph is bipartite with two equal parts, then you can have half of the nodes in your independent set, right? So if you take the left part or the right part, that's the independent set. But if graph is not bipartite, then you cannot do that. But you make, if your algorithm is local, you will never see whether the graph is bipartite or not. For that, you have to look at the long cycles. But the graph is local, take a random regular graph or random regular bipartite graph, locally you won't see the difference. So it makes no sense to ask of local algorithms to solve arbitrary global problem uh, unless you have something like correlation decay properties thanks to exponential weights or something like that. But generically, that's not even an interesting question uh, to ask. However, uh, recently, a, 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 a a particular framework of local algorithm was introduced and the conjecture was made that at least as far as the random regular graphs are concerned, not bipartite, random regular graphs are concerned or random graphs are concerned, perhaps then we never need to look at, uh, uh, at, the, at the algorithms which are non-local for certain class of problems. So now let me actually dissect that and make it uh, precise. What's the framework, what's the problem, and what's the conjecture? Right, so that's what I will do now. Um, the framework of local algorithms is called in this uh, in this um, area was is called for certain reasons called IID factors, and that's mathematics perspective. So for now on, I will I will exclusively look at the random regular graphs. So we have uh, n nodes, uh, n node graph uh, degrees are all d and chosen uniformly at random. We've seen this model several times already yesterday. So no need to explain what it is uh, now, hopefully. Uh, this is a definition of local algorithms. I, I would imagine that you don't like what you see here on, <laughs> on the slide. It's too technical, it's, uh, it's a bit uh, too involved. So let me instead uh, try to uh, explain it by pictures on, on this board. So the idea is, um, okay, so here's, you have a big graph here, you look at the node, and when, and the node locally, uh, in the neighborhood around the node, locally looks like a tree. Unless you go into deep, uh, uh, unless you look at the substantial neighborhood, but for any constant depth, random regular graph locally looks like a tree. So this, in this case, for example, it's a three regular uh, graph. Okay. Your hope is to have a local algorithm. What's local about, uh, what's local here? Every neighborhood looks the same, right? Every neighborhood looks exactly the same. Looks like a truncated, truncated regular tree. So the idea is that, well, the only hope of doing something clever to introduce some kind of a randomness for tie-breaking uh, reasons. So let's populate uh, nodes with some weights, W1, W2, W3, and, and so on, some uh, weights here, W. I say MW, I'm writing U. <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, so you put some random weights, U1, U2, U3, and U4, and maybe you're making a decision based on observed weights uh, in, 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 in your neighborhood. But formally, what it means is that 
suppose you have a function f which maps uh, the following uh, thing into the following thing. So you look, you look at the deregular tree with depths r. So tree which has basically this tree, precisely this tree. When this tree is populated by some observed weights in between 0 and 1, suppose you have a function which maps this into a decision either 0 or 1. That's your local algorithm. All it says is that I observe weights in my truncated tree based and use function f, and I call it f sub r to make a decision. So for example, if I want to try to find an, a large independent set, then I will, uh, I will use this rule. How am I going to use this rule in the entire graph? Well, I will just use this rule locally for every node. For, I will generate for all nodes of my graph, I will generate weights, and I will generate them, let's say, uniformly IID, uniformly at random, from 0, 1. Because, I, because what else can I, what else should I use? I want to use continuous weights with some distribution, so I might as well use random. Choice of distribution is really not relevant here because you should think of them as random seeds that fit into whatever else you want. So in any event, you, you generate these weights, u1, u2, u3, and so on, uh, populate your entire graph with these uh, weights. Then for every node, you look at the constant size r neighborhood. That neighborhood now looks like this. And then you apply this function, f, and make a decision. Yes? Oh, because I'm considering a random regular graph. And the random, so I'm considering this object, which is a random deregular graph on n nodes. And it's a, a property of such a graph that most of the nodes, uh, when you look at the constant size neighborhood, look like this. Most of them. Yeah, you have little, actually, the violation is, is small, but. Uh, right, and most is good enough because when you try to do so solve problems such as largest independent set, what you do with this little small fraction of nodes is not really relevant in asymptotic sense. Um, any other questions? So that's that's the definition. Is the definition of the local algorithm clear? That's that, uh, and that n type of local algorithm is called uh, is called what. Uh, 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 it's called IID f uh, factors. Uh, because you have IID weights and you factor them through this function F sub R. Okay? So, and that's what I have uh, just repeated here in a formal way. So, here's the conjecture. So, conjecture in, in vernacular says that Local algorithms should be able to solve combinatorial optimization problems on random graphs, random deregular graphs. And specifically, what, uh, in this paper, the following conjecture was uh, framed, that specifically the maximum independent set problem, cardinality, we back to cardinality problem, uh, on random uh, regular graph can be solved by means of local algorithms thus defined. Which, what it means is that, formally, that you should be able to exhibit uh, a sequence of functions because in order to gain a lot good accuracy, you want to expand the, you want to make this perhaps radius larger and larger, but still keep it constant. So mathematically, you, unfortunately, you have to use double limits here. So what it means is that you use a particular, there is a sequence of functions f, such that when you, design, when you use this function to make decisions, the output of these decisions are independent set, which are asymptotically optimal. So you like look, look at the ratio, uh, relative size of the independent set, and see how it increases with increasing the neighborhood size, the conjecture that you will gain asymptotic ratio of the largest independent set. I n star is the cardinality of a largest independent set, that's the independent set that you get from by using your local rule f, 
you look at the uh, limits, conjecture is that this is achievable. Yes? Right. So uh, the algorithm is run. Uh, okay. F first of all, let me d p perhaps demystify this this limit in R. Think of R as a think of first having some epsilon that you want to have a guarantee of finding uh, epsilon close to the largest independent set. From this epsilon, you're saying let me take R, which is something like one over epsilon or one over epsilon squared, and then you fix R. So R is fixed. It's just you make R large enough to achieve epsilon accuracy, but R is fixed. How do you run the algorithm? You, you fixed R, which is function of epsilon, you fix your rule, which whatever clever rule, and then you run the algorithm in parallel on the entire graph. Generate this random weights, generate this random weights, and for every node, simultaneously look at the neighborhood, look at the observed uh, uh, no, uh, weights in this neighborhood, make a decision in parallel. Now, your question is that if I know that this node is already in, of course, this neighbor should be out. Well, if you're claiming that your function is actually good enough to produce large independent set, at the very least, it should be produce an independent set. So it should include the fact that you never make decisions for node and its neighbor to be included simultaneously. Oh, That's in the, is in the function, all right? And not only that, uh, this conjecture doesn't say what is this magic function f is. does not put forward a particular conjecture about this magic function. It, say, it just says that such magic function should exist. Is it allowed to depend on the property of any graph? Particular, well, the conjecture was framed for the random regular graph. No, 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 but does it, it does depend on the sample. Doesn't depend on the sample. On the sample. Is random, yes. This one, so there are the probabilities. There, there exists a function. Oh, uh, well, for every, good. For almost all graphs, or how it's a. Yeah, yeah, so you take a random uh, a regular graph. So, well, first, uh, it turns out that whether you, you look at the largest independent set itself on this graph, this limit exists in an asymptotically almost sure sense. And I will talk about that. So for now, think about this as expectations. But it turns out, for straightforward reasons, you have concentration around expectations as well. So these are high, probabilities, uh, uh, high probability objects. But we're looking at the uniformly generated uh, uh, deregular graph. But the function f is choosing before you choose the sample Yes, because otherwise, what? Uh, yeah, because yeah. You, yeah, you choose some function f, you're saying, okay, I'm going to use this function as my algorithm to generate an you know, independent set. This might look like, this might look like th that this is very, this is actually silly. Why, why would you have, how can you design such rules that actually are consistent and produce even an independent set, let alone independent set which are close to optimal cardinality? But it's actually not such a silly thing uh, to do. Well, first of all, by means of references, this can be done for uh, the conjecture is true for the somewhat related maximum matching problem. In that case, you can design such local rule, but it doesn't really tell you, give you an, uh, an intuition. So let me, and you can do other things as well here, but let me give you a simple example where such a local rule actually produced a reasonable independent set. Yes? Uh, yes. Uh, but isn't the largest maximal set doesn't have that have a vanishing uh, proportion as R tends to? No, in not in not in sparse graphs. When D is bounded, I'm I'm, I'm looking at, at the deregular graph where D is fixed. Oh, it's a deregular. Uh, it's R a random deregular. It's not an R regular graph. Okay. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Confused. Yeah, it's a deregular graph. Yes, deregular graph. Did I do it correctly here? Yes, deregular graph. But yeah. There is a bit of, uh, okay. Um, so l let me give you a simple example of a such local rule which, which gives at least an independent set of, of 
reasonable size, linear size, in fact. And the rule is, uh, it's actually an old algorithm which is known by as Luby's algorithm, and it works very simple. You simply look, okay, you generate these random weights, and for every node, uh, you look at neighbors, and if you happen to have a weight which is larger than the weight of every neighbor, so if W0 is bigger than W1 and W, I keep saying W, right? If u0 is bigger than u1, u2, and u3, then you're saying that f of a, of a node, of this node, is equal to 1. Otherwise, it's 0. So if I happen to be a largest weight among all of my neighbors, I'll put myself in. Otherwise, I will, I will put myself out. And that clearly produces an independent set, because you cannot have two nodes which are neighbors and say, and produce one here and one here, because one of them is larger than the other. So that won't, uh, that won't work. And this algorithm will actually produce an independent set of linear size, because the likelihood of this event is constant, some number that we don't really care about, but it's a positive constant. And therefore, with this probability, you'll produce an independent set of linear, prob prob with, with, not with probability, you will produce an independent set, linear, proportional to the probability of this event. Probability is a quarter, very good, yes. <laughs> yeah, you're right. So, but in fact, if you do that uh, for large D, What's the probability in this case? It's something like uh, 1 over d plus 1. So this, will pr this algorithm, the Lubis algorithm, therefore, will produce an independent set uh, based on this rule. Independent set will be roughly 1 over d plus 1 times n. And that's nowhere near asymptotically optimal. Let me tell you what's, what's known about the sizes of an independent set. Well, first, when, I, when, I, when we discuss this ratio, a priori, a priori it's not even clear that such a ratios do exist. Uh, there is a concentration around the, the value, but the fact that the expectation of the largest independent set normalized by n the fact that this limit exists by itself was not a trivial problem, but, like, but we managed to resolve it. Okay, so from now on, we can safely say that, that the independence ratio exists, and it's positive. So let me call it alpha d. It's a function of the graph uh, d. The fact that these ratios also are well-defined, that's, that's a more straightforward observation because you have a bunch of essentially independent, random, de dependent decisions. For non-overlapping areas, the decisions are independent, and therefore you have a, a limiting uh, value. So that's not terribly uh, complicated to show that all the limits that I stated earlier are well-defined. But what do we know about alpha d? We know that as d grows, it's not order 1 over d that you would get from Luby's algorithm that I had here. It's actually bigger than that. It's twice log d over d. And then you can also mine the second uh, order correction term if you want, but the, the, this, this is the term I want to focus. The largest independent set is of, of that order of magnitude. And now, all of a sudden, I will introduce another problem. Well, I, won't, I will mention it by means of reference, is that this question of the local algorithms and trying to find largest independent set and so on come up in many combinatorial optimization problem and has been studied mostly in the context of so-called random case satisfiability problem, which is a Boolean constraint satisfaction problem. And then there is a similar asymptotic value for the at what ratio of clauses to variables you can actually find a satisfying assignment. Now, I want, in the interest of time, I will not dis discuss the Boolean constraint satisfaction problem, so let me actually uh, just means by means of reference say that similar sort of searches for solving optimal, uh, optimal problems on random graphs uh, are done for other problems, so, but, but let me focus here. What do we know about, let alone local algorithm, what do we know about any algorithm that are capable of producing independent set of good size in random 
the regular graphs. Graph is a random, so P not equal to NP is besides the point here. We are trying to find algorithm which work well on average. So what do we know about that? Well, it turns out in the, con in the case of bounded degree, degree D, we hit a snack here. We hit a wall, which is that you can, on the one hand, you can design a very simple algorithm which achieves a ratio of log D over D. So it's twice smaller than this one, twice smaller than the optimal. Factor two away from the optimal. And the algorithm is sometimes called a greedy algorithm, but it should be called a stupid algorithm because it's not even greedy algorithm. The algorithm is very simple. It's, uh, it's basically make a r completely random decisions uh, in arbitrary order. What it means is that pick an arbitrary node. Don't even look at anything. Pick an arbitrary node and put it into your independent set. But then you just kill all the neighbors. So all the neighbors are killed. And then you have the remaining graph. Pick an arbitrary node. I promised, I said it's stupid, and it is. Uh, kill the neighbors and repeat and put it into your independent set and that produces some independent set. And that independent set will have a cardinality log D over D. Uh, it's not, technically it's not even greedy, although it's sometimes called greedy algorithm because greedy algorithm, you would pick this node with the smallest degree, right? That would be greedy, but you're not even greedy. You're not doing anything clever at all. Well, the, the fascinating thing is that I, we have this algorithm which produces log D over D, and that requires a proof, but can be done. But no one was able to imp improve on that in any meaningful way. There's no algorithm which is known to achieve the ratio uh, factor larger than this, let alone twice log D over D. Yeah? And there is a similar story in the case at problem where the ratio between the, what you can do by stupid algorithm and what's where the truth is one is one over k where k is a close size but we'll stick here now in light of this it seem in light in light of this if you hoping to have a local algorithm which is based on I, iid factors hoping to find some rule f which is a local rule which will produce asymptotically optimal independent set that would be great i mean that's that's that would be nice because that would bridge this, bridge this gap, even conceptually, in the sense that even, even knowing that such a rule exists would be nice, uh, would be nice because then you can, at the very least, brute, in brute force, try to go through all possible such functions and do something about this. So, n naturally, when, when, we, when we saw this conjecture that the local algorithms can bridge this gap and actually bring the truth all the way to the uh, optimality here, we were a bit skeptical, and it turns out for the right reason, uh, as we showed in the joint work with, uh, with Madhu Sudan, the conjecture fails. Uh, the Hatami Lovat and Zagidi conjecture is not indeed valid, in the sense that no local algorithm, however cleverly you're designing this algorithm, F, however well you do that, it will never produce an independent set larger than this factor of the optimal this factor of the uh, optimal. So that's the claim. Let me pause and ask if you have questions about the claim and then I'll try to give you some intuition behind <coughs> this. All right. So interestingly, the proof re relies on a fascinating um, uh, progress that was done recently in the theory of spin glasses, but specifically in the theory of mathematically rigorous version of spin glasses. And it's related to the so-called clustering or also called shattering phenomena. 10 minutes to introduce spin glasses is not a good idea, but luckily I don't have to do anything, I don't have to introduce any kind of physics here at all. Because the fallout of, uh, of, of the theory and approach is a very, very simple picture. So let me describe the picture as it as is. And it, oddly, even the proof of this picture is rather straightforward. 
So it's not even clear why we needed to start from something, fa something so sort of elevated as spin glass theory to go, back, to go down to this simple picture. Let me describe this picture for independent uh, set. Ignore the top part, which is a formalization of this picture. Just look at this picture. The picture says that, in fact, the log d over d, that threshold where algorithms, all known algorithms fail, and below this threshold even stupid algorithm works, is not an arbitrary number. Something interesting happens here that's called shattering or clustering. And what's interesting is the following. When you look at the independent set of the size, let's call them problematic, size for which you don't have algorithms. So look at the independent set, for example, of this size, of this size or, 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 or larger. It turns out that this independent set are, uh, the sp space of this independent set is very clustered. In a sense that any, if you take any two such independent set, either they will have a very significant intersection or they will have a very sm a small intersection and never in between. So, and that becomes a very profound picture, especially close to here. So what it means is that if you take independent set close to the optimality, any two such independent set either agree 80% of the time, or disagree 90% of the time. And you can never find independent set which have an overlap and agree, let's say, 50% of the time, or 60% of the time. And that interval of disagreement becomes wider and wider as you move here. And that's a formalization of the statement. Unfortunately, this picture we can only prove above this threshold, although we believe that it actually holds below this threshold as well, but the proof technique only works uh, at this point and above, and that's this uh, approximation for which the claim was made. So, but, but provided that indeed your beta is above uh, in this region, what it means that you're looking at the independent set of that size, one plus beta, when beta equal to one is the optimal possible, any two independent set of that size have intersection either larger than this quantity or smaller than this quantity for some zeta uh, of beta, z of beta smaller than beta. Yeah, normalized. My apology. Yeah, so any no two independent set of size, relative size normalized by n, uh, uh, have intersection in between here. So let me pause here. That's, that's an important sort of technical attribute of, 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 of and that's, that's the property that will allow us to refute the conjecture, so I want to make sure that, that that's clear. So hopefully the, 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 the claim is here that, that uh, you have this picture, it's basically partitions, this, basically in, if you're a physicist you can think of it as a very rigid landscape, so uh, the states with near optimal energy are separated from each other by values of, exp of exponential size in, in, in some sense. So you have, to, you have to overcome exponential barriers, as the physicists would say, to go from one, from one ground state to another ground state. So that, that's, and that's why spin glass theorists are interested in these kind of things. But for us, just think of it as simply this, that kind of a separation, that clustering. So the, the, the picture is simple, as it's it just described here. Not only the picture is simple, the proof is simple of that, surprisingly. Because all you do to prove that claim is that you take pairs of, you com compute the expected number of pairs of independent set which agree, let's say, 50%. So you say, how many independent set I have in my random regular graph which agree 50%? Turns out, and that's that, uh, that th this quantity is easy to compute because the graph is uh, random or random uh, in a random regular graph, that's a relatively straightforward quantity to compute. It's called the first moment method or second moment method, but you know, so take my word for it, it's really uh, a few lines, uh, it's, it's, a really, it's, it's, uh, it's not that complicated conceptual, not that complicated computation. So you look at the expected number of pairs of independent set, which let's say agree 50%, and you show that this expected number goes to zero exponentially fast. Now, if the expected number goes to zero, that means with, probability, with high probability you have none. Because you're looking at the number of pairs of independent set, 
expected, goes, expected value goes to zero, that means you have none. That's how you prove this picture. And now, in the remaining uh, time that I have, let me give you an illustration of, of why this property, this clustering property, in fact means that local algorithm cannot <laughs> possibly produce anything of the size of independent set where clustering phenomena takes place. And that's an, for us an interesting and exciting uh, development because this provides the first link between the clustering property and the, and the failure of algorithms to do anything uh, to, uh, to, uh, to perform well. That link was conjectured and sometimes was confirmed but indirectly. So you take a particular algorithm and you see that it fails at the clustering threshold. But you don't prove, make, but the proof of the failure is not based on the clustering property. In this case it is. So clustering property is precisely the reason for the failure of algorithm. That's, that's what at least we found uh, uh, interesting. And the proof idea is, uh, uh, is, is simple. Well, if, uh, Okay, so let me at least try to give you, I, I will substitute words for, 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 for the notation here, but, uh, uh, but this is roughly how it goes. And it will be a short proof, and I'll, I'll wrap up. Suppose you had, this magic power, you, you had this magic function f, which was producing something close to the largest independent set. Maybe not exactly largest independent set, but pretty close to 2 log d over d. So, for example, it, produ it produces something of the size 1 plus beta log d over d, where beta is, where beta is above the threshold for which we're saying it's not possible. So that's your claim. You're having your magic function f, and you produce the independence ratio of that size. The idea is, well, how did you produce that ratio? Remember, you populated your graph with random weights, uniformly random weights, and applied this rule. So what we're going to do now is that we're going to use your algorithm that, that you claim works well. We'll do it twice. Generate not just one sequence of uniform random variables, but two sequences independently of each other. Do it twice. If you do it twice, you produce not one, you produce two independent sets. Each of them, as you claim, are, are large. They, each of them achieve a significant size independent set. So one produced, so no uh, independent set I is produced from U1 up to UN. Independent set J is produced from V1 and Vn. Now let's see what's the overlap between these two independent set. Let's argue about the overlap. When you look at the overlap, it's, it, it becomes immediate that their overlap is actually very small. It's something like log D over D squared. And the reason is as follows. Um, when you apply your algorithm, remember that your rule that you apply in every node is the same. It's this function f. Right? So if you take a node, you observe certain collection of weights, the probability that this node i was placed into your independent set is the probability this function f took value 1 on this neighborhood, well, you said that it's 1 plus beta log d over d. Right? Because that's the independent set size promise that your algorithm has. But notice that this randomness here is completely the function of random weight realizations in this neighborhood. Because the graph is a tree. There's, the graph is not changing, it's a tree. So when you... Tree. So when you do it once, you first you do it with respect to weights u1 up to un. When you do it again with respect to v1 and vn of the same thing, not only you get, you get the same size, but the probability now that these probabilities are independent because they are with respect to independent seeds, which means that the likelihood that your node belongs to both independent sets is just the square of the probability. Now, your probability, individual, pro oops, pro individual probability was this, so the likelihood that, that both nodes belong is squared of this probability, which is this order of magnitude. That's the only reason that the order of magnitude is this. Right? 
Now, the thing is that this is very small. When d is large, this is very small, much smaller than just log d over d. No, we're not done. We, all I said is that these two independent sets have a very small intersection. So what? Small intersections are possible because all I'm, I was saying in the previous uh, claim, in the previous uh, picture here, is that intermediate intersections are not possible. Small intersections are possible, but then the natural next idea is to interpolate. So the idea is that start with these weights and slowly move from this collection of weights to this collection of weights using some interpolation parameter p. And it works like this. For each vertex i, either use u weight with probability p or v weight with probability 1 minus p. And then again, it's a uniformly chosen random variable. So w, thus chosen, is again uniformly uh, chosen random variable and in, in independent. And now look at the independent set produced by this W's, right? Okay, when P is equal to one, I claim that uh, all you've done is just your new independent set produced from W's is the I independent set. Why? Because P is equal to one, so with probability one, you were just choosing u's, and that was the original independent set. When p is equal to zero, all the weights are v's, and you produce the second independent set. So you've moved from the first independent set and the second independent set as you increase p from, from one to, decrease p from one to zero. Well, the point is that that trajectory is in fact continuous in the overlap. And the reason it's not too complicated to show, because your decisions were based on the local information, if you change your p slightly, that means the, change, the likelihood of switching from u to v is very slim. You don't see this difference on a small size neighborhood. The likelihood uh, of that event is small. So indeed, when you're making decisions locally, this is a continuous trajectory from one independent set to another independent set. And that means you're going to cover the entire ground from the, overlap, the entire overlap, so when the two, in the two sets overlap here, to the overlap which is very small. Right? And, and therefore you will fall, but this interval is huge. It contains the interval for which we know no two independent set can have an intersection. So somewhere, be, somewhere within this large interval, there is a smaller interval stated in this uh, theorem here, this intermediate interval, which simply we know does not exist. Pictorially, basically what it means is that while if local algorithms work, you would be able to go from one essentially ground state to another ground state in a way which is like it's like going from one mountain peak to another mountain peak without ever going down. But you cannot do that continuously because we said the picture is that you have to go down. So that's, that's, the, that's the, how the argument works. And therefore the uh, conjecture is, uh, is not valid. And uh, when, when I mentioned this conjecture to some physicists, they immediately said, oh, no, no, it's obviously wrong. It cannot be possibly the case and so on. It was even silly to conjecture that. So I have, to, I have to disagree with that. <laughs> and, then, and, and, and here's the phrase that I like. The theory is good not when it's correct, but when it's interesting. This theory, th this conjecture was, well, admittedly, it's, in, 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 it's not correct, but it's interesting because it provided a framework of local al algorithms which was analyzable. And in the ongoing work, in the current work, it looks like this framework can be used to show that not just local algorithms defined like this, but the local algorithms that physicists conjectured that work would not work either. All right, so it's not a, such a stupid theory. It's wrong, but it's not stupid, right? So, but to wrap it up, there's two algorithms called belief propagation algorithm and survey propagation algorithm that physicists, and I won't describe it uh, offline, I'm, I'll be happy to, but I won't describe it now as my time is, uh, is up, that they do conjecture that this algorithm work for independent set, K-set model, coloring, and a whole bunch of other uh, models. 
But it looks like, and that's an ongoing uh, project, but uh, with, with, Madu, with Madu, it looks like even this algorithm, you can essentially frame as versions of local algorithms, and therefore using the same approach, one might be able to show that they actually uh, uh, fail. And uh, we will see, well, I mean, that's uh, ongoing work, uh, so we will see that that actually works out. But that would be, that would be interesting because that would answer in negative way something that physicists conjecture to be. You know, physicists usually are right, but sometimes they're wrong. <laughs> so on that positive note, I'll stop and thank you very much for your attention.